All right. Well, thank you again, everybody, for joining us uh, for tonight's uh, Monday guest speaker series. Um, if I have not met you before, um, or even if I have, um, my name is Shannon Sheehy, and I am the uh, manager of strategic partnerships for Code Louisville and Code Kentucky. So basically, that means that I am working with our employer partners um, to help get you all connected to them, uh, as well as overseeing our career coaches um, and really just managing the career readiness piece for you all. So you'll really engage with our team a little bit more uh, closer to the end of the time um, with us, closer to the end of your class. Um, before we get to our speaker tonight, I have just a few announcements to share. Um, so first of all, I do have the speaker's bio up on the screen. I'm not going to read the whole thing, um, but would love for you all uh, to peruse that as we're um, waiting here to get started. Um, we are not going to have a guest speaker next Monday, um, October 30th. We're going to take that week off, but we do have a couple more planned. So we have a uh, developer to software engineer path with Joe Kratzit, who's out of Lexington on Monday, November 6th. And then Emotional First Aid 101 um, with Dr. Ami Shah on December 11th. Uh, Ami is actually a, a graduate of the program who has mentored for us in the past. Um, and she's put a talk together that deals a lot with um, mental health and taking care of yourself. And a big component um, of her presentation is dealing with job rejection, which I know uh, I have experienced. And I'm sure um, many of you on the call, if not everyone, has experienced uh, as well. So uh, we're looking forward to that. Uh, as always, if you all have any topics um, that you would like to hear about or uh, any speakers you wanna get us connected with, please do so. Um, we're always looking for suggestions on those. Um, we'll probably schedule one or two more before the end of the year, and then we're gonna pick back up again after uh, MLK Day in January. So uh, we have a lot of slots to fill. Um, in relation to that, uh, our careers team is working on uh, more engaging events, so keep an eye out for those. We do have a career day coming up um, next week uh, with Atria in Louisville. Uh, that's on November 1st, so be sure to check the jobs channel in Slack for more information on that uh, and to get registered. Um, we're also working on more hiring events, um, newsletters, all kinds of fun stuff to engage with you all, um, so keep an eye out for those. Um, and then finally, if you are a current student um, and you're attending as part of your career readiness requirement, um, please be sure to fill out the form in your Google Classroom to get credit for attending. Um, I think the last time I looked, Tanya had not um, turned that form on yet um, for the August folks. So you may um, see that here in the next week or so, um, but you can fill it out retroactively. Uh, otherwise, just a couple housekeeping items. Um, if you all could, please keep yourself muted throughout the presentation. You're more than welcome um, to unmute when we have um, questions, uh, things like that. But otherwise, I'm trying to cut down on the background noise because we have quite a few people on the call. Um, we also have a chat box. So down in the bottom uh, right hand side of this screen, you should see a messages um, box. Those go to everyone. Um, I'll definitely keep monitoring that and I can um, throw questions out to Kelly if you all have them. Um, so please um, feel free to utilize that tool. Um, so tonight, um, which brings us to our speaker, we are joined um, by Kelly Berkmeyer, who's going to present on her own journey in technology, which I am very excited to hear about, um, as well as how technology is used today. Um, Kelly has over two decades of experience in the tech world, and she worked her way up uh, from tech support with no experience, sound familiar, a lot of you probably in that same boat, um, to COO at ISOCnet, which is a Cincinnati-based uh, IT as a service company. Um, Kelly is um, hoping for this to be an interactive experience. So again, she's going to tell us um, a little bit about her own background. We're going to hear from her. Um, but please also have questions ready. Feel free to start throwing those in the chat as you think about them. Um, we want her to be able to uh, share her thoughts and experience uh, and answer any questions that you all have. Um, so with that, I will go ahead, uh, Kelly, and turn it over to you. And thanks again, everyone, um, for being here tonight. Thank you, everyone. Glad to be here. So uh, my name is Kelly Berkemeyer, and I am with ISOCnet. So I started back in 1999 and I knew nothing about technology. I could probably barely type, to be honest with you. 
And we were the first company with 56K dial-up modems. You can imagine how slow that is back in the AOL days. So uh, that's how we kind of entered the market. And then DSL came along, Zoomtown, where the speeds got a lot quicker. And we were actually developing websites before Google even existed. So I had started out as technical support. Uh, again, not really knowing anything. So I was going through training. And then from there, um, went into the billing department because the person who was running into the billing was uh, moving on to, she was graduating from college and moving on for, into the education field. Uh, so I went into that. And then I was going to college at NKU for my business administration degree. Uh, so continued to, as technology evolved, I got to learn more about the business side of things. So that's where I kind of moved into director of operations and bringing on new products and services. Because you can imagine how um, technology has changed so much. So Microsoft 365, for instance, was one of the big things that I had pushed. Whenever it first came out, it was actually BPOS, uh, which was like business premium online services. So it's when people had exchange servers in house, they were moving that to the cloud. So um, kind of jumped on that. I was around when we were really even did some cell phone services because uh, that kind of came through from the flip phone. And now you see the smartphones that we have. Uh, and then, of course, the website development side. You know, when we first started, you had to have such a small website for it to load because you're on, you know, 56K modems. So it was really important that you create this experience uh, for the users. And then, of course, uh, we work with so many uh, businesses. At first, it was like, well, we have the yellow pages. What do we, what do we need the, the Internet for? What do we need a website for? Um, so it's been really interesting how everything has involved so much. And today, we are pretty much everything in the cloud, which, you know, the cloud is really just a server in a data center somewhere or across multiple data centers. And we were even doing that back then uh, with dial-ups, and we had to have T1 lines and ISDN lines for people to be able to connect at faster speeds. So um, we kind of went down that path and we see a lot of people actually go back and forth because there's always been a conspiracy for businesses. Like I have to control and have my own data, but now things have evolved so much. The internet speeds have also evolved so much that um, you can easily have a cloud experience just like it's in the office. Sorry, I'm at home. Hold on just a moment. Sorry about that must see something outside um so then in and in today's world now we are dealing with new cybersecurity issues and risk as well as uh, ai has anybody been involved in the ai or have you guys talked about that at all i'll give a quick answer it's not an official part of our uh, curriculum. We don't have like a pathway in it right now, but since it's been such a growing thing, it's definitely something we're looking at. And we've had quite a few speakers in the last few weeks um, who have augmented some of our um, curriculum and, and things with um, talking about AI, chat GPT, yeah. um, so, all those related topics. Yes, and BARD amongst uh, some other new programs, the co-pilot that's coming out from Microsoft. So with all the technology changes, it is advancing at such a record speed. Uh, so it's going to be pretty amazing to see where things, you know, where things go. So I know you guys are a lot in code. So that's one thing that has definitely evolved where, you know, you started out with HTML. Um, and there was even a time from Google where you had to have a mobile version and a desktop version. Um, and then in 2017, smartphones were so popular that surpassed um the desktop so now they went mobile first and they only have one search engine which is mobile based and they of course have continued to evolve and have different standards on the coding how clean it is how fast it is uh, for websites to be built among many other applications so that's kind of uh me and my history in a nutshell does anybody have any questions or is there a particular area of interest that anybody has where it's like, hey, I want to hear more about what you did in this area? Because uh, as I mentioned, we're IT as a service, so we've gone 
connectivity, dial-up, managed services, meaning we're taking care of people's computers to all of the digital marketing, programming, pay-per-click side. Kelly, just to uh, kick us off, I have a question for you. Um, we have students who come from all different backgrounds and uh, may end up in a first job, for example, um, that they're hoping will help them grow and, and move up within a company. Can you talk a little bit about some of um, the transferable skills or soft skills that you had um, that you think helped you succeed going from different roles like tech support up to COO? Well, number one is going to be communication. That's really key. So many people don't necessarily understand the technology. So it's important that you're able to communicate that because if you're too techie, you're going to talk over people's heads and we're using acronyms and nobody understands it. But the big key is we have to apply that technology to today's business world. Every business relies on technology, whether it be their email, their website, their um, accounting application, their you know, business line application, manufacturing, it, it's going to go across every single industry. Um, and that communication is going to be huge. And the ability to learn. I know you guys are in a program and this is great, but there's it's going to be very challenging to walk out of that program and be up to date on the technology that you are going to use and apply in a business world. So being able to apply skills. So you may understand the technology in one way, but you have to be able to apply that in so many different areas, and that will take you so far. Uh, and being able to be responsive on those. And, you know, Google is your friend. Google has so many answers. AI has made some things easier as well. It's not trustworthy, but it can definitely get you in a good start um, and can even write a little bit of code for you that you can test out and then tweak from there. So communication and the ability to learn. Uh, so and being able to apply those skills across the board in whichever area you went into. Uh, I went into the tech support, so I was just get, answering dial-up calls. You know, it was pretty um, cut and dry at the time. And I was able to also network with other engineers, well, my bosses and their engineers, to be able to say, hey, how does that work? You know, I'm really interested. I don't understand DNS. Like, wow, it's blowing my mind. What does that mean? And they would be able to show me, and then they taught me. I mean, I remember when virtualization came out. I probably had a four hour sit down with my network engineer as a please like tell me and he was so excited because it was new technology. He was like, OK, I'll show you because this is so cool how this works, you know, because we went from this. You just have a physical machine to now you can take this one physical machine and break it up into 10 different machines and then you can have 10 different machines and break it up into 100 different machines and have them work together uh, much like a RAID hard drive works the same way with a uh, with the actual server. So it's so amazing how far technology, but if it's something that you're interested in and you can show that passion, I believe that's going to go a long way and it's going to be fun and you're going to be able to want to research it and understand it. Absolutely. Yeah. And we always uh, iterate with our students that we're teaching them how to learn. Um, so once they get into the job world, they can learn all kinds of other new things that they're going to need uh, to succeed in their job, both at this time and um, as they continue to move up. So I think that's great advice. Yeah. In this industry, it will be never ending on learning. Absolutely. Well, thank you for that answer. Um, Scott, I'm going to go ahead and uh, if you want to go ahead and unmute yourself, uh, see your hand up. Hello, how you doing? Good. I'm uh, one of those uh, students that Shannon was talking about. I'm from the 2018 cohort, uh, but I just want to see as far as like how you feel about things with the new landscape and a lot of you know companies, especially after COVID, going remote for somebody getting into job roles and working maybe remotely but wanting to climb the ladder. How do you suggest they go about like finding you know mentorship and you know, getting with people and, and structuring time to get with, uh, you know, high performers and roles and being able to excel that way when you're working in, you know, different circumstances like that, not necessarily in the office. Sure. And that is definitely becoming more and more popular with the uh, remote work. But I think the key with that is as you, if you're doing support, going that extra mile to understand it and ask the, and not ask if you have a question, 
to somebody who's maybe higher up than you, instead of just saying, hey, what's the answer? Say, you know, here's my train of thought. Like I searched this and I tried this and I did this. And they're going to be much more willing to help you because you're showing that initiative and you're showing the motivation to be like, oh, you're getting this. And then they're just helping you along the way. I will say one of the more frustrating things for higher end techs that I've seen is asking the same questions and not actually doing any legwork yourself. So I think that can go a long way. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Kelly, can you tell us a little bit about, um, I guess, just like how ISOC has changed throughout the years? So was there ever a point when you all were like, does this make sense anymore? Do we move on to something else? Do we shut down? Like, was it ever so much with all the changes that you all just didn't think you would exist anymore? Or how was that process look like to adapt to new technology? Sure. So, you know, there has been a lot of changes that have occurred. So we went from the dial up to the DSL era. And we there was probably 25 dial up companies in this in this uh, in Cincinnati. Uh, next to Fuse, Fuse is still around, but they've all dissipated or they went into a particular field and then they maybe are still around as something completely different or they, you know, died off. So uh, we did build the biggest DSL network in this area. And I don't, I'm hopefully everybody's familiar with DSL, ADSL, and I'm from Cincinnati, so Cincinnati Bell, um, if I refer to that, everyone may not be familiar with that. But we built the largest internet network and they came down next to the, the primary since I built Fuse provider. They came down and said, uh, you know what? We lobbied this and we're going to um, monopolize. We're going to turn this off so you no longer are allowed to sell through since I built. So they deregulated basically the internet provider. So all of our network, they took our customers and said, you're out. And that was probably about a third of our business. And we were like, wow, we just got screwed. Um, but it happens. They're kind of a big guy. And we said, well, now what are we going to do? Because internet's not going to be our focus anymore because we were, inter we were a large internet company here. So we had to make a change and say, what are we going to do now? Um, and we really went after the design and development and email services because we have plenty of businesses coming to us going, look, you were really great at that. You always helped us. And that's what differentiates ISOCnet from everybody else is our customer service and our response time. And we're easy to work with. So we're always going to make it super simple for the customer to be responsible and just solve their problem. And they might be calling about one problem, but we may solve three other problems along the way because we're there to help. Uh, we want to make technology easy. So some other things, um, we also built up a pretty big data center space and technology was changing really quick and we went to the virtualization and there was so much investment in hardware that we had to go through that was really challenging and scary because as a company we're entering new technology that we have no idea about we don't have experience on it we're relying on our team to go self-teach them uh, they we were able to work some with vendors but I'll tell you one thing with technology, applications, it says it's going to work one way, but it never does. Uh, there's always something that is going to not work properly, or they say they're great at this, but then they're really not. They forgot to tell you about, you know, something, some other complicated thing. So uh, that was definitely a challenge moving over to that virtualization platform. But it was well worth it because what it did give you is uptime and fault tolerance. So that means back in the day, if a server went down, everything on that server is down in people's, whether it's their website, their email, you know, whatever they might be using is down and it's very stressful. So with the virtualization came, it could be down and everything would automatically move. And then our engineers had less stress. And they had more time to fix things and get in there. Uh, we also built quite a team of developers, which was challenging because we had a big team and sometimes somebody would quote something and then they would be way off and then we're stuck 
trying to have to still cover, do what we said we're going to do for the customer, but now we're doing it two and three times and it's costing us too much. So we actually decided, um, and I can't remember what year it was, probably 2015, 16, we had decided, you know what, let's not have a development team. Let's not have an in-house, let's use contractors. And what we did was actually offered our employees, we would continue to contract them, but we're going to pay them a higher amount, but they're going to be a 1099. So for them, they can work with other customer, other people. They're making a little bit more money, but they got to pay their own insurance. And the win-win for us was when they quote us something, they have to stick with that number. So if they screw it up, they have to fix it. And I was so scared to do that at that time. Um, the CEO was like, nope, we're doing it. I'm like, I just, we won't have any control over these guys. What if they mess it up? What if we don't communicate? What if something happens? But to be honest, it was a blessing in disguise. And it has worked out fantastic. And we've been able to broaden our skill set with different people. Again, we've helped some of our employees start their own businesses and be very successful. We've also helped other people um, who work for us go into a different, very specific area that they want it to. So we help get them connected with the right organization. Just because we've been in business a long time, we know a lot of people. Um, so that was kind of a, a scary time, but it was really good. And uh, now we've been very successful with that web development and digital marketing. Because again, we've got people who focus and are really good at what they do. We don't have to have five developers. You have to do all these things. So that worked out. And then another thing we did was uh, managed services. We actually purchased a managed services company. And we had a team of about 15 IT engineers. We were managing, they're going on site. We've got customers. Um, and that also became to a point where we said, you know what? We're kind of falling behind and our guys are not being as good at trying to manage our web servers, the customer's web servers. And they're, as you get, as you grow, there can be some other HR challenges. And that was another piece of the business right before COVID actually. We decided let's source this as well. Let's work with the partners that we know and have the same values as we do um, and have them be our IT. And then we don't have to worry about that technology or spread ourselves so thin as a company. Uh, so we have a, evolved to this more of a company that we are working with specialized partners. <laughs> So we work with Cyrus One for the data center, which is a big data center here. And they're actually worldwide, uh, but they've got the only tier three facility in uh, Cincinnati. And then we also work with some managed services. Uh, we used to run our own mail servers and spam filters, and that could be really stressful too. Um, and working now with Microsoft 365 uh, exclusively with just a few G Suite customers that now they get to manage those infrastructures and we're managing the relationships with the customers. We understand the technology and we make sure it works for our customers. And that's a great kind of company place to be. So for us, we have a lot of breadth. So for somebody entering the market, we have you know offered some people some positions where it was entry level. We could teach them so much of what because of the breadth things that we do and then they can decide, do I want to be a developer? Do I want to do I like the system administrator? Do I want to go be help desk? Um, do I like sales better? That they can kind of determine what they like best from there and be able to grow. And that's been exciting to watch some some different individuals flourish in that way. That was I think that sounds, <laughs> yeah, no, I think that sounds really cool. And I think that really lines up well with what we do here. Um, just because, I mean, we've had, um, thousands of students at this point finished courses with us um, and we've had over 850 um, enter the tech job market after completing courses and it's all across the board so i think it's really important um, and really cool to hear you reiterate just how many opportunities there are out there and just because you start in one area doesn't mean that you necessarily have to continue with it and you can uh, definitely build upon it right absolutely um, we had a question from candace uh, in the chat uh, Candace is wondering, how do you, um, with you meaning either as a business or as a team, determine which risks to take when adopting to new technology? So we're going to do our research and we are going to, we're going to test it. 
we would never give an unproven technology to a customer unless we were completely upfront with them and said, look, we don't know, we'll work with you and we'll try it. Uh, so transparency is very important um, as a business value for me. But usually it goes along with the proven technologies and customer demand is where it's been. You know, with the BPOS, uh, when that first came out, I learned about it from our customers. I didn't learn about it from Microsoft because they were, this was their kind of pilot. They didn't, you know, they weren't there yet. Uh, this was over 10 years ago. So this was their pilot test. I was like, well, wait a second. If this, they're doing this already, we need to learn about it. So we used ourselves as the guinea pig to jump on these services and test them out. That way, not only did we understand the technology, but we experienced it so we could really help and support our clients because it's like, hey, we did this. We know how it works and we know how it's going to impact your business. I wish it was easier. It was, you know, there was a formula or something for that. But another big thing that we have recently added uh, since COVID is the whole cybersecurity stack. That is a big growing area. The cybersecurity, uh, it has been, it's 4,000 times more threats out there today than there was, you know, pre-COVID and billions of dollars. I mean, in fact, there's other countries that it is their job, normal job, completely legal to hack Americans. Uh, so it is definitely a growing business, multi-billion dollar business on the dark web. So it is uh, a really good service. And what we do is we do a stack and we do a layer. And I did a lot of research on that before we applied it. I tested everything out. And there is part of it where with some of our risk, you know, I need to ask, we are not going to overinvest. So a lot of times in technology, you get what's called NFRs, which are not for sale. So vendors will give you a license to use for free so that you will use it and you'll sell their product. So that does often allow us to say, okay, let's test this product out or, and then we only buy it based on this is, I have a commitment. So I don't say I'm going to go buy a thousand things and then have to go sell them. And that's just part of our business model. Very cool. And I didn't think that you were just shaking a uh, magic eight ball and hoping <laughs> for the answer <laughs> and making those decisions, but it sounds like you all have a really sound uh, decision-making process. I know there's a lot of factors um, that go into that. Um, Candace did have a uh, follow-up question. So she wanted to know, uh, how often do customers approach your business with requests for newer technology um, as compared to how much time your business spends explaining, teaching, or selling current or updated tech to customers? So we probably spend a majority of our time explaining, teaching, and selling the technology. So we work with a lot of small businesses, so not necessarily enterprises. So we're working with small businesses and they just have a need. And a lot of times that need is going to come from it might be operations saying we have to have this software. Uh, we see a lot of requests coming from marketing because marketing wants this cool website and they want this fancy automation and they want all these things and they need to be able to support it. So we uh, do get that kind of request, but a lot of it is also we are working with clients and we're managing their stuff and it's like, guess what? Your technology is 10 years old. It's reached end of life. You are now a security risk and you have vulnerabilities and you've got to upgrade. So sometimes it's probably more of pushing them along the way, uh, but it does come. We also have seen some more requests for the technologies through cyber insurance and um, some of the demand. So as, as of 2025, you know, there's been an executive order put in place that companies and anybody who supplies the government has got to be com NIST compliant. Um, and we're seeing a bigger push two across uh, at larger companies. So for instance, uh, Toyota is a very large company, but I have customers that supply Toyota maybe in a very small way. Maybe they're making screws, you know, so they're not really making a whole lot or they're manufacturing this one little piece and not even all of it, maybe just in Georgetown. So they have to also be compliant. So now they're saying we have to do this to keep our core business. So again, I still think it's more of explaining the tech, uh, the technical side, because a lot of company and business owners are still like, oh, it's like a cost. They don't always see the value 
or the return on investment when they're paying for technology. It's more like, I just have to do this to be able to produce what I need. And then we have a lot of old school people, you know, don't fix it if it ain't broke. And in today's world, 10 years is a long time. If the years ago, they've got equipment that's been running for 50 years, these manufacturers are like, why was my computer not run that long? Well, it just doesn't really work that way, unfortunately. How do you kind of handle some of those conversations? So um, if you have a customer, for example, that maybe there really is a pretty big security risk or you're seeing that they need to make a pretty major change, how do you, what are some approaches, I guess, that you take to convince them of that, that aren't just, hey, we want more of your money, pay us to do this thing or pay somebody to do this thing for you? So I will use stories because I actually have clients who have um, just this last year, I had a client got a business email compromise and they wired half of a million dollars to another company and it was gone because it was a wire transfer. I had another company got compromised and they got into their bank account and because they had hacked their phone, I guess they had actually called Verizon and got some, um, their SIM card or something changed. So they were getting their phone calls and those texts from multi-factor. So they were able to get into their bank account and steal money that way, which unfortunately was they were not able to recover. So try to just share real world experiences. Same with facts, because I mean, the facts are 80% of businesses deal with a compromise of some kind. And we're seeing that it's Businesses in the U.S. have spent billions of dollars on payouts to, in order to resolve the problems. Uh, and everybody anymore has gotten compromised. And I think the shutdown, um, the pipeline, really was a wake-up call for the United States that, wait, this technology can truly impact our livelihood, uh, as it did when the pipeline shut down. And there has been tons of more cases, and we've also seen a lot of businesses go out of business. Because how can you, not everybody's set up to recover from something like that. The last thing that we do is we do a third party vulnerability and penetration test on their network. So if I'm really worried or about a customer or sometimes it's a new client, I will go in and say, let's just run this scan. Because I can't tell you know them everything that's behind uh, every door and every crack or every hidden file on a computer. But these scans can really help uh, and they will often also point out because the biggest problem in security is people. Uh, people are saving their passwords in Chrome and they're using really weak passwords and they are using the same password across all of their different accounts. And that when that happens, one password gets hacked, then you can get possibly into that organization and really get into confidential information. Or that's where people get their you know email compromised. So um, those scans can really help with that and show clients how important that is or how many holes they have. So for instance, even having personal identifiable information stored unsecurely on the network uh, can open it up as well and people can be sued and, and lose a lot of money in that situation. Those are some excellent examples and I'm sorry that that's happened <laughs> um, to clients, but yeah, I think that um, definitely having those as kind of a uh, warning and a real life uh, example must be really helpful in those situations. Yes, unfortunately, there's too many, you know, examples that go on on a regular basis for big companies and small. Absolutely. Yeah, I can only imagine. I've been getting uh, a text every day from the post office for the last week, the post office, <laughs> Uh, telling me that a package can't be delivered. And uh, I'm just Shannon from Code Kentucky. I'm not a business with millions of dollars. <laughs> so oh, they, yeah, it doesn't stop them uh, because if they can get into your bank account or steal your identity to get a credit card in your name, uh, there's so many different things that they're doing. And obviously with COVID, um, you know, unemployment got hacked and a lot of people lost a lot of money and struggled for a while to even get that. Absolutely. Well, thank you for sharing those. Um, I did have a couple questions uh, sent to me before um, from some folks who couldn't make it, but um, I'll ask those. But just again, a reminder for everybody here, if you want to either raise your hand or throw a question in the chat, we're happy to field those. 
Um, but can you talk, Kelly, a little bit about um, some of the things that you're most excited about when it comes to tech? So any of like the new technologies out there or any sort of opportunities that you see either um, personally um, or for ISOCnet? So I don't know if it's excitement or fear. Um, <laughs> so one thing that I do and we do really well is some of the digital marketing. So we're paying Google to get ads and get people to contact our customers and buy their products. And it works scary good. And they are continuing to add all of the different uh, AI to it and machine learning. So it's getting smarter and smarter. And obviously, we'll, whether we know it, you will realize or not, we are being tracked. I'm sure everybody's had that conversation and then they're like, I just was talking about that. How is that on my Facebook? Or how did I just get an ad, you know, come across my screen? Cause I was talking about that. They are listening, uh, they're learning from us. That is actually where the chat GPT, you know, AI came from uh, because your Google, your Aunt Alexa, all that has been listening to us. Um, in fact, even a lot of the smart TVs and things like that are having been able to pick that up. Sorry, Alexa, I have one. She just responded there. Um, so it's been very powerful in how it works. Now, there is a whole lot out there right now about security or about privacy. Um, and so it'll be interesting because actually Google is supposed to stop using cookies. Uh, they were supposed to stop it in 2022, then 2023, now 2024. So it'll be interesting to see if they actually do that. And I think they're well, their goal with that, it was to be able to use all of the data from AI and that big data that they gathered to start putting people's behavior in um, in these categories so that they can provide a better search result. So that's, um, that's one of those things that is kind of really cool, but it's really scary too. And I'm curious to see what happens in that particular market uh, with the privacy, with even the Google cookies. You know, that's where a lot of people will say stop using it because they're tracking you they're following you you know use one of these other browsers uh, that don't do that but when you do that you don't get the same user experience that people are so used to and i think unfortunately so many people are so very trusting of you know you think your phone nobody's going to get it nobody can you know see your stuff but it's just not true um, and if anybody has seen or not seen social dilemma on netflix i highly recommend you watch it it's a really good movie about just the whole um how they are basically taking our information and using it to influence us so besides that um i think the ai was going to be really interesting that's kind of exciting i really want to see i can just i can foresee this co-pilot product that microsoft has really evolving over the next you know three to five years into something pretty amazing so what copilot does is it uses all your applications uh, within microsoft so you could say we're having this meeting and i could say now go create some notes from this meeting um, and it will use all of the information or recording because i use teams so if i was on teams it will use that and it can use powerpoint to make a presentation it can use my word document my history to then create, uh, I can say go create a, a contract for this person and it can do all that for you. So I think that'll be interesting to see how that goes. I agree. And I know um, even just as uh, our program continues to evolve, we're trying to figure out uh, different technologies that we should be training on or at least pointing people toward training on. Um, and I think we're going to see a lot more of that yes. <laughs> here in the next couple of years. Um, Kristen has a question. Um, she wants to know, as a new student in programming, so like many of the folks here, uh, security issues and attacks seem very daunting. Do you have any suggestions on how to manage these, um, maybe for smaller scale applications, uh, as well as how to stay up to date on um, the latest protection methods, technologies, things like that? So for me, it's all about layers of protection. So you have your one you've got even if you just use automatic updates for windows you need to make sure everything is current um but anymore it's not just about have antivirus because the way antivirus works is it's going out and it's checking for known viruses it's looking at signatures 
So there's other advanced um, threat protections available that will do what they call hunting. It's called endpoint detection and recovery or in response. So uh, basically it's gonna look for weird things you want to, on across your computer and it's gonna stop it. So that way it is more than just uh, antivirus looking for signatures, it's just watching the activity. And then there's also where a layer where it's watching logs to see what's happening. And if there's a particular security or event uh, log, it's gonna look at it and it's gonna say, okay, this is malicious. So it's all about layers of protection um, I would recommend that you, you know, never get on, you know, just a public Wi-Fi. Be careful. Even just plug in your phone or a computer into, at least your phone where it's a power over Ethernet, um, into like an airport or whatnot, because there's just so many new things that come out. Uh, but some of that, those programs will help with that. And I always suggest using a VPN. Um, there's free ones that are available that you can use. I believe I use Cloudflare on mine, and there's also different DNS filters on top of it. So DNS filters are gonna do it at the, the edge to not let you get to malicious sites that are known already to be a malicious site. So it is daunting and it is scary, but if you put the layers in, then you can feel like you're more protected because that's what it's all about. They're, you're gonna be attacked. Everybody is gonna probably eventually be attacked in one way or another but you got to make it harder for them to get through. So if all you have is antivirus and you aren't keeping up to date on your Windows patches or security patches, you're just making it easy for them. Or you, if you decide to go to Starbucks and get on the Wi-Fi and do your work, it's not a good, you know, not a good place to be. Um, and the reason you don't want to go to those public Wi-Fi hotspots is because anybody else in that location could be on that same Wi-Fi. And even if you're on a VPN and you're like, well, I'm good, where it gets from you to that Wi-Fi, they can be watching all that information, gather, gathering all that information. So what I'm getting is layers are perfect for uh, our Midwest weather right now, as well as for <laughs> uh, yes. security features. So perfect, excellent advice. Um, I did have one more question um, that had been sent to me earlier. Um, we kind of talked about this, you were talking about it earlier with um, folks kind of moving into different roles and kind of finding what their fit is. But can you just talk a little bit about what some of those roles are? So maybe some of the more tech adjacent type positions that folks have gone into um, at ISOCnet? Um, sure. So we have obviously your tech, your kind of tier one technical support role. And when it comes to tech support, you can be doing a lot of different things. So I've worked with people who do tech support just on Active Directory or um, the desktops or printers. So you can specialize or you can kind of really go across the board where it could be your internet, it could be the network, um, it could be the computer, it could be software update. So obviously the, the more, um, the more you know, the better kind of support technician that you can be, but you can get them specialized. So you could go into a system administrator if you like to work on hardware. So you could go into that. You could go into networking if you just like to see how the communications are working with everything. Uh, you any more there really is the whole security. Um, so they have security operation centers now that are really just looking and responding to those kind of event logs I was talking about. That is now a specialty. Uh, you can get into the design side of, of things. So you've got web design where you just wanna make things look really pretty. Um, then you can get into kind of that UI where it's about how people are gonna use like an application. You gotta think about where's the buttons gonna go? Um, how are they gonna click on that? Will they know to click on that button? Is it very intuitive? People don't want to think. So you've kind of got that whole user experience in that type of a design. Uh, then you also have the development side. We've got people that do focus on WordPress, where it's just, you know, making WordPress sites. You can also do um, maybe a little bit more involved development. So maybe you're getting into .NET or even if it's PHP or any other specialty language, you can really go into that where you're understanding that and you're actually making that functionality work. Um, and you're using that CSS, you know, that a designer developed from. 
You can also get into uh, software as a service development. So uh, like Shopify is an e-commerce software platform and they have their own language. Uh, we also work with application developers like who do Sage software, which is an accounting software for businesses. It's a large accounting software for a lot of businesses. So you would have to want to customize, you understand that database, you understand all of that. So you can dive into that. Uh, you can also get into, um, you know, application, like if you like phone applications and things like that, or even uh, gaming development is a way to go from the development side. Um, you can also go into the digital marketing where you're like really good at the Google, you know, pay-per-click and things like that. Um, you can get into Microsoft 365. Um, that is really growing because they keep adding more things and you can even go take, uh, there's a lot of free courses. I believe it's at learn.microsoft.com that you can go and at least watch the videos and learn. Um, and sometimes, you know, you can at least maybe get uh, an NFR development environment with some of those. So learning that can go a long way. I kind of think that when you get into, if you want to do that virtual cloud, Azure is probably going to be, you know, a way to go. That's Microsoft's. Uh, virtual servers so you can build servers and you can build infrastructures out for them you can be a microsoft 365 expert there's you know people think it's secure but you have to go through and do the settings in order to be concerned in order to be secure so there's a lot of configuration to that whole microsoft 365 back end they've got security compliance um, they've just got active directory you can actually manage computers through Intune now with them. They've got a great AV. Um, if you're looking for that and you like have your Microsoft 365 or Outlook or, or um, you know, the program gives you one, I definitely take advantage of that. Uh, it's a good it's a good AV program. And it can also extend to the cloud if you're using OneDrive and things like that. Uh, then, of course, you have the whole, you also have SharePoint. SharePoint is a Microsoft collaboration platform that's also big on programming make a lot of money programming in that um, I've worked with some companies who charge two three three hundred dollars plus an hour to do some of that programming and businesses are running their entire organization on it and it does require maintenance um, and it's only a growing a growing platform you also can get into the security side of things the whole cybersecurity is just a whole new kind of industry and a lot of it is kind of pushed through NIST because companies can't, you know, your data security is just as important as your physical security anymore. You know, if you're at a bank, you've got a, a guard out front. Well, now it's like if you have data and there's anything valuable, you have to have that guard. You have to have somebody watching it, monitoring it, uh, responding to it, possibly doing forensics. Forensics is a whole nother industry because somebody gets hacked. They have to bring in a forensics team to figure out what happened, uh, to say they have going to take this computer that got hacked, they're going to find out how that, what it is, how it got in without infecting anything else. So it is vast, wide and far. So I'm um, sure it's probably might be a little bit overwhelming, like, oh, well, which one would I like? Um, and that's where, you know, just kind of getting your, your feet wet um, and possibly even in like a support role could give you an idea of some real world experiences of what type of IT work you may like to do and what type of company you may want to work for. Is it a small company? Is it a big company? Do you want to be a, you know, really in-depth and specialty at one thing and know it in and out? Or do you want to have a little wider view of things? I hope that answers your question. Yeah, that's really helpful. And I will take that opportunity just to give a quick plug um, for our students. Um, as a reminder, we have a full uh, staff of uh, employer uh, coordinators as well as uh, career coaches who are here to help you navigate the tech world. Um, that's my team. So feel free to message me and I can get you connected with the right person. But we can help you all with resumes. We'll talk to you about what your interests are. Um, we'll talk to you about employers that we know that might be hiring um, that would be a good fit for you. So please use us. We are here um, to help. Um, Kelly, just to wrap us up, because uh, I know we're getting close to time, 
Um, if you had just one or two pieces of advice um, for folks on this call, so people who are, um, for the most part, getting ready to uh, kick off their tech careers, um, what would that advice be? I think um, one would be networking. Networking is really important because sometimes it's easy to kind of get stuck in the tech world and be like, I'm just doing my thing, got my head down I'm, and I'm on it. But networking can go a really long way with helping advance your career uh, and just putting yourself out where even if it's just networking events that you go to, a lot of the different chamber of commerces will have free networking events that you can go to. And sometimes they even have specialized events, whether it be um, a technical event, a women's event, you know, could be all over the place. So that might be something that could be uh, helpful for you. And then just constantly learn and apply going to be the best way to kind of advance and grow. Absolutely. And that's what we try to tell them anyway. So I appreciate uh, the little echo there. We didn't there. even talk about this. <laughs> yeah, I know. We did not. We did not plan this. Um, I always laugh. I'm like, it's really nice to hear um, just like out in the wild, people echoing our advice back to us. I'm like, all right, that's a good, <laughs> good temperature check. Um, I did throw in Slack. So uh, like Kelly mentioned, uh, or in the chat, I mean, um, like Kelly mentioned, networking is a huge piece um, of landing that first job and beyond. Um, and our tech events uh, channel in Slack has all sorts of events that are going on in person, virtually, um, for niche groups, for everyone. So please check that out. Um, I think that's invaluable. I've gotten quite a few of my jobs uh, in the past, including this one um, from networking. So um, really its value cannot be um, stated enough. So true. Yeah. Well, Kelly, thank you so much um, for joining us tonight. I think you had some excellent advice and I know I learned a lot, which is uh, always exciting. I love hearing from our speakers. Um, thank you to everyone who attended. Um, we would love uh, for you all to keep joining us at future events. We'll be sharing those on Slack as we get them scheduled out. Um, I'll also share the recording out here in a couple days uh, in case you want to revisit anything um, that Kelly shared with us. Um, but thank you all again so much, and I hope you have a great night. Thank you, everybody. Take care.